announcements for you. If you've got your bulletins, please take them out. Uh, one announcement that is not in the bulletin, as you will see on the ends of the, ends of the pews, there should be a little blue booklet. Those are attendance registrations. We would ask that whoever's closest to it would take one of those and sign your name and put the pertinent information in and pass it to the center. And then uh, someone will gather them up at some point later on, but we would like to do that. We'd like to start doing this again in order to, well, kind of watch who's here and who's not here as far as meeting ministry needs. So please pass those along if you would. Other announcements, the Keystone Bibles, those are due by May 10th to April. Take note of that. Uh, the Messenger is on the back table, the current copy, the current edition. I've got a copy, but I haven't looked or read at it yet, but Erica, I'm sure, has done a great job, so we thank you, Erica, for that, and anyone else who contributed, but they're on the back table. We'd ask that you take one per family, please, one per family. Sunday school classes, if, you haven't, uh, if you've missed a class, uh, they are online. you got the address there, so if you need a class on the uh, role of men or women or biblical finances, you can go there and pick up uh, whatever you missed on our website. Uh, a reminder to the elders, we will meet briefly right after church up front here for a special prayer need. So elders, please uh, remember to come up here right after church. Okay. Any other announcements that need to be made that I've missed? Okay. Seeing none, this time we're going to quiet our hearts a little bit and Dominic's going to, or Cindy's going to play a little for us for calming our hearts and getting our hearts prepared for worship, and then Dominic's going to come and share with us. I would like to share this scripture. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. So as we come to, to him, let's, let's continue to remember that this morning. Cindy. church for our call to worship this morning um, if you want to follow along I'm going to read Ephesians 4 verses 29 through 32 um, I've actually been in my own devotions been um, reading um, in, in Ephesians um, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, as, as God in Christ forgave you. So as I was reading this, um, I had a few notes that I really have been kind of trying to work out in my own life. Um, so I have a couple questions that I wanted to pose this morning is, do you have malice towards someone? Do you have bitterness towards someone? Maybe you're angry about the way our society is. Or maybe you're angry at someone. Well, let's put that behind us this morning and come to the foot of the cross. And let's praise our God and Savior for shedding his blood that we can be forgiven. And let us forgive those who may have hurt us. Um, Christ has forgiven us. That's what the passage says. But we are supposed to forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us. So this morning, let's praise and worship the one true king. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today, and thank you that we're able to come and gather and worship in this building. Um, thank you for choosing us before the foundation of the world. 
um, and for your word and just all the amazing things that you have done. I pray um, that you just be with each and every one of us this morning. Um, I pray that um, as Todd brings the message that you will just speak through him. I pray that you will just open our hearts and our minds this morning. Um, and then if any of us may be struggling, I just pray that, that we would just come to your cross and that we will repent and just, just look upon you and all the things that you've done for us. And I pray all these things to your precious son's name. Amen. Good morning, church. If you're able, please stand and worship with us.
matched us as human beings. We just worship you today. We just honor and praise you because you are God and you reign forever. Lord, just be with us this service. Let your words sink deeper than ever before into our hearts. We just give you honor, glory, and praise in your name. For our prayer time this morning, I should have a handout in your bulletin. As you can see, it's quite extensive. It's almost the whole page there. I'm not going to read down through all these since you have them there. Take them home with you. Uh, put them on your refrigerator or put them in your Bible whenever you do devotions and whenever you have your prayer time. Just uh, get this list out and think of these folks on here that need prayer. I would like to highlight a couple of them. An update on Karen Gadsby. Uh, she had surgery this week and she's doing pretty well. Uh, they hope to get out of the hospital on Monday. So she had to have her knee redone again, basically. She had a bad accident and they did surgery on it and put stuff in there, metal in there, and then they had to take it out and put new stuff in there. So she was in a quite a bit of pain. So pray for her. Uh, pray for Joe Kendra. He's having surgery this week. It's coming up. Long awaited for Joe, but here it comes. So we'll be praying for you. And I uh, want to also pray for Robin Anyer. She's here today, but I, she fell and uh, hurt herself, so it's good to see you here this morning, Robin, and uh, pray that you get well soon. And an update for Jimmy and Hannah. Hannah had her C-section, and she is not allowed to lift even the new baby yet. And this has been about almost two weeks now, so the doctor's got her on restrictions, and so I want to pray for them. Well, to piled stuff on top of bad stuff. Not that that was bad, but they got her, and all this rain we got this last week, his basement got flooded out, and now his hot water tank isn't working. So his dad's over there trying to give him a hand, figuring out how to get his hot water tank hooked back up. And then Jimmy's been off of work for the baby, and he has to go back to work tomorrow. So pray for Jimmy and Hannah and the Gregories and the, the new babies and all that's going on there. So pray for them also. Okay? Well, let's go before the Lord this morning with all of these prayers and requests. I'm not, I'm not going to pray for all these individually. I may highlight a couple uh, because of the nature of them, and then, uh, then we'll close, all right? Let's just take a moment, if you would. Oh, yeah, Dad. Dad. Uh, She's where? case you didn't hear that or for those that on the line didn't hear we're asking for prayer for barb homer she's at the cleveland clinic right now she has afib aneurysm and other leaky valves so i'll pray for barb also all right yes thank you uh the carol peace and carol peterson passed away this week uh the funeral arrangements are being made they're meeting with the director tomorrow there will be a dinner here for the family on friday we're not sure what time yet because they haven't met with the funeral director uh, but that will be here. The ladies will be supplying a dinner for the P Carol Peterson family. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, let's go to prayer then. Take a few moments here yourself and reflect and ask God to bless our time and to uh, anoint your heart this morning as we come before him. Lord, we give you thanks for your, my, your many blessings that you have poured out and you do continually pour out upon us. Uh, we see how beautiful of a day you've supplied for us this day on your Lord's Day. And, and after so much rain this last week, Lord, we've given us a day or two to dry out. And we give you thanks for that. We know you love us, Father. We know you care for us. We, we know that you have are looking down on us to bless us in those areas where you have seen fit, Father. But we love you, Lord, and we praise you for what you're doing. We praise you for your son, Jesus Christ, who willingly came and offered himself for us that we may have eternal life. Father, we pray that as we meet here this morning that we would never forget the gift that you've given us 
of eternal life. We pray, Father, as we meet together that you would, your, your word would be proclaimed this morning, Lord, that you would be lifted up and that all things would be done in orderly and done to glorify you, to glorify your son, Jesus Christ, Father. May we be filled with your knowledge this morning. May we be filled with the work that you have for us to do, Lord. May your spirit rest upon us, Lord, as we do those things to help those in our church, uh, as we do those things to glorify your name, Father. Give us the strength that we need. Give us the patience and the long-suffering, especially for those who suffer with ailments and suffer with uh, physical conditions, Father. And we just pray that you would just reach down and touch them. I think of especially for Jimmy and Hannah and the birth of their baby. We give you thanks for the birth of the baby and that the baby's doing well. But we pray for these other issues that Jimmy wrestles with, with the flooding and the water tank and going back to work, Father. We just pray that you would just reach down and, and bless that family today, Lord. I do continue to pray for Karen Gadsby, and we thank you for the surgery she's had, and thank you that it was successful, and pray that you continue to heal her and watch over her. We pray for Joe, Lord, as he goes for his surgery on the 16th, that you would strengthen him, lift him up, Father. Uh, may he sense your spirit presence with him, even as he goes in for surgery, and then for the recovery afterwards. Uh, back surgery is a, is a long recovery, Father, so we just pray for even the time afterwards, that it would be a time of refreshment for Joe, and a time for... Uh, just reflecting on you, Father, and, and healing, Father. We pray that this would be successful for Joe in all that he does there. Uh, Lord, we just continue to lift up others. We pray for Barb Homer, especially as she's in the hospitals this morning. Lift her up to you, Father, that you would touch her, talk, direct the doctors and all that they do and all, over here. And for all the others on, this, on our list, Lord, that have physical needs, we do lift them up before you. We do ask that you would reach down and touch them in their time of need. You have all things worked out, Father. And we're not always, we don't always know why such things happen. We don't know why people like Randy have suffered for three years, but you do, Father. And you know what the purpose is, and you know what the reason is, and we trust in you for that purpose and for that reason. But we do pray that you would strengthen these folks. We pray that they would glorify you through their uh, issues, their physical issues or emotional issues, Father. We pray that you would, they would just draw to you, that they would cling unto you, that they would be drawn near to you, Father, in all the, in the suffering that they're taking place in their lives. You never promised us, Father, we would have suffering, but you did promise that you would be there. And so we thank you for that. We thank you for your presence of your spirit that draws us and leads us and guides us in all things, Father. I do lift up the folks in uh, Myanmar, Lord. I just pray that you would just help them, watch over them, Lord, bless them, uh, comfort them, guide them, protect them especially, Lord, in, in all that's going on there. Just watch over them, Lord, we pray. We give you thanks, Father, for this time. I pray for Todd as he brings a message. Um, may that which you've put on his heart be that which is put on our heart. And uh, we pray for the balance of the service. We thank you, Father. We love you. We give you all praise in Christ's name. Amen. We have two scripture readings this morning. Uh, the first is found in the book of Acts, the second in the book of 2 Thessalonians. And uh, as we read these, I'd, uh, it'd be good for you to put a, a marker in the page, whether that's your bulletin or a ribbon. Uh, I was instructed that we'll be flipping back and forth quite often to these today. All right, Acts chapter 23, verses 32 through 35. The next day they left the horsemen to go on with them, with him, and returned to the barracks. When they came to Caesarea, I was going to say, that seems a little odd. Acts 20, same verses, 32 through 35. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. 
I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And then flip over a couple more books to 2 Thessalonians. We're going to be looking at chapter 3 and reading verses 6 through 15. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you. Nor did we anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ, and they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person... And do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. All right, now we can stand and sing our first hymn. play through this once for us and then we'll sing.
senior church kids can be dismissed. We will be uh, studying out of Ephesians chapter 4, but we will definitely be turning to the passages that Dan read as well. And so um, please turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Our focus is going to be verse 28. I'm going to pray and then we're going to jump into the sermon and we'll eventually get to verse 28, I promise. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Fathers, we just sung, we pray that you would just give us more and more, help us to know more and more about our Savior, about his life, about his love, about his holiness. We pray that you'll work in our lives. We pray that you would just help us to grow. We've come here hungry today. We've come here hungry to hear your word and to grow from it and to be encouraged by it, to be changed by it and to respond to it and to leave this place. We've come because we're your followers were your children. We've been purchased by the blood of your son. We love you so deeply and we want to just be all that we can be for you now. We keep coming back to the cross. We keep seeing the blood. We keep knowing of your grace. We keep recognizing our own sin and yet your forgiveness. We just see our unworthiness and yet we're your children and we thank you so much and we just want to be all that we can be. So help us now. Help us as we study your word today. Open our eyes. Be with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I love history. I read a lot of history. Um, I, I love going back. And when I go back in time in history and hang out with, with people in, in history, I, I often think, what, would, what was it like? And, and how different are we today? And I say that by way of saying that I'm really concerned about us today. Why do I echo when I go over here? Shut that thing off. Shut them all off. All right. Uh, not me. I, I'm worried about today, though. I'm worried about us. And part of it has to do with my understanding of history. Can you imagine what it would be like with no electricity? You never saw a movie. You never heard a radio. You never saw, let's do a podcast. You never scrolled on a phone. You never saw any of that. Can you imagine what that would be like? It's hard for us to imagine that would, what that would be like. But what I want to say is, is that I think that's not our life. Our life is filled with movies. Our life is filled with commercials. Our life is filled with podcasts. Our life is filled with Facebook. Our life is filled with seeing other people's lives and everything like that. And it's having a really bad effect on us, okay? And one of the really bad effects on us is this. And I'm noticing it uh, increasing with each generation. And I'm really afraid for these little ones that are here. I'm really afraid for them. And I'll tell you why. And this is going to be hard for me to explain, so try to hang with me here. I've noticed, especially in the 30s and 40-year-olds, <clears throat> especially uh, now I'm noticing it, there's something of a disappointment with life. There's something of a discontent. There's something that is missing. There's something elusive that they haven't somehow experienced, and they don't know what it is. Maybe I'll change my job. There's a desire to keep changing jobs. Maybe I'll move somewhere. Maybe I'll change my, and, and, and I think part of it has to do with, okay, the college education is over, and I got the career now, and it's okay. I'm married, I, I, got, I, I got the romance, I got married, if you're married, and now we have the children, I have the child, but, but there's, got, there's, there's gotta be something else, there's gotta be something out there. And I think that that has been fueled by all of the, Beautiful women we've seen in our lives on screens, all of the handsome men, all of the successful people, all of the happiness, all of the vacations, all of that. Like, by now I should have a yacht. By, by now I should have a, 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 you know, a, a, a Porsche. By, by now I should, uh, and, and it's elusive. It's out there and, we're, and, and we don't really know what it is. And people are disappointed and, and, and that. And normal life is boring and drab. And they don't know how to handle that. And, and we've lost something really valuable. Number one, I think we've lost the wonder and glory of all that we have and what God has given us. We've lost that. And I want to urge you parents, 
The next time you are feeding a child in a high chair, I did that this week. The next time you're feeding a child in a high chair, your child in a high chair, I want to urge you parents, stop for a minute. Don't stop worrying about all that's going on the floor on all that's going on the dress, on this shirt that you have to clean. <clears throat> stop worrying about everything and look and study that child. Look at his eyes. Look at her nose and mouth. Look at how, watch, think about her brain and how she's developing and look at the miracle and wonder and mystery of what you have there. Look outside your, 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 your drab house to your drab yard and look at the trees starting to blossom and think about the miracle of what God is doing. Thinking about that root system and all that is being drawn up and the photosynthesis that is happening and the miracle that is happening there. I think we need to recapture the wonder of life itself and what we have and who we are. A friend of mine, a very dear friend, in fact, he was the best man at my wedding, once said to me, he's, he's the kind of guy who kind of looks at life differently and, and you get a lot of insight from that. <clears throat> Now we're two old guys, and we're talking on the phone. And he says, Todd, come to the realization I'll never be great. And I laughed. And he said, no, Todd, I'm serious. And I thought a lot about that. See, a lot of us feel like we're going to be great someday, or they're going to finally see us, or we're going to be an influencer, or our podcast is going to, or our family is going to be something, and we're going to be this. And, 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 and Keith came to the point, I'm not going to be that. I'm just going to be me. This is it. This is it. And he said it in a positive way, this is good. This is okay. Now, I want you to keep all those thoughts because I want you to think about the book of Ephesians, okay? In the book of Ephesians, Ephesians, the book, the entire book can be summarized in two sentences. Know who you are and be who you are. Know who you are. And for the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, we have been looking at this. Know who you are. Know who you are. Look at what grace has done. Look at what God has given you. Look at who you are. Look how special and, and what God has actually done. And then in chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul says this. Therefore, the pris I, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. In other words, he's saying, be who you are. And so for the next part of the, of the book, he then outlines that. And so he begins with, though, the first half of the book is know who you are. Know who you are. You're chosen by God. You're adopted into his family. You have been raised from the spiritual death to spiritual life. You have been given the Holy Spirit. You are in union with Christ and you are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. You are the church of the living God, the temple of the living God. You are the family of God. You are a body. You are one with Christ. He is the head. You are the body and his life. <clears throat> I dropped my glasses and my hearing aid. His life flows through you. I preached last week in Maryland and somebody said, how in the world do you expend that much energy in one half hour? I will never know. <laughs> Well, there you go. His life is flowing through you and in you. You are his beloved children. And you are now the new humanity. That's who you are. You were the old man. You were in the old Adam. You were under the dominion and power of sin and reign of sin and death and the devil. And God has lifted you up from that. And he has placed you in the new man. He has placed you in the new man. And there you are. The new man's going to fall on that thing. So... And that's who you are. That's who you are. You are this. And all of that, Paul says, includes something that I want us to focus on. It includes the call to holiness. The goal has always been holiness. Look in chapter 1 and verse 4. <clears throat> the very beginning of the book of Ephesians. <coughs> Excuse me. The very beginning of the book of Ephesians. Look at chapter 1 and verse 4. For just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Here's God's choosing. Here's us in him, union with Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. The plan was that we would be holy and without blame. Now look at chapter 5. So that's before time began. Now in chapter 5, the, the, the focus in this verse is the end of all time. When we are presented as a glorious bride to, to Christ. And notice what he says. 
Husbands, love your wives, verse 25, as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. The whole plan of God is that we would be holy, and we have been called to be holy people. And you see that. That's who we are as the new humanity. We have been called to be a holy people, a holy people. Let's look at this on the screen in other passages. First Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16, Peter writes this, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, the end of all time. As obedient children, notice this next phrase, not conforming yourself to the former lusts as in your ignorance. That's the old man. You're done with that. Put that off. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Now notice that phrase. Be holy, you who have been, but as he who called you is holy, you be holy in all of your conduct. There's the new man. Because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, in verse 1, it says this. <clears throat> Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Look at this. Cleanse yourself from the filthiness of flesh and spirit. That's the old man. Put off that stuff from the old man because you've put off the old man. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God, that's the new man. Put on the new. Or Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. We have been called to holiness. That's what it means to be the new humanity. But listen to this. We have also been enabled, equipped, to, and made to be holy. We've been raised with Christ. We've been made alive with Christ. We're alive in Christ. Christ's spirit lives within us. We have within us as the new nature, we have the Holy Spirit working, leading, guiding, filling us, mortifying sin, bearing fruit. We have within us as the new humanity to be holy. And so that's what, that's what we're focusing on here in Ephesians 4 is this call to holiness. So then that leads us to the question, what is holiness? Well, what is holiness? Well, holiness, by the very meaning of the word, the word means to set apart, to set apart for sacred purposes, to treat special, to set it apart as sacred, as holy in that sense. And you get this sense of separation uh, when, when you see it. Remember when, when Moses goes to the burning bush? Whoa, man, that bush is burning, but it's not burning up. It's burning. That's crazy. And all of a sudden, a voice came out and said, take your shoes off. You are standing on holy ground. In other words, God is saying, I am here. This is special. I am special. Take your shoes off and show respect. Remember in the temple, they had, the, they had the, 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 the outer court, and then they had the temple, which was a holy place where only priests could go. And then they had the holy of holies where no one went, just the high priest one day out of the year, because that is where God dwelt. He was special and set apart and sacred in that sense. That's what the word holiness means. And God is holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. God is holy, and we're supposed to be holy because God is holy. Now, what does that mean? That means that holiness has the sense that God is special. God is, is, is majestic. God is pure goodness, pure light, pure righteousness. And because he's so pure in all of that, that he's to be treated and he's special and he's to be treated special. And that's what God has been, was, was trying through the entire Old Testament to teach us. Habakkuk 1 verses 12 and 13 say this, For you are not, are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. That is, what, that is what holiness means. So then what does it mean for us to be holy? How, how, what does it mean then that we're called to be holy? How does that work? 
Well, let me begin sort of saying that there are false views of holiness that we need to sort through. Men oftentimes get confused with this question. What does it look like then that I would be holy? What does holiness mean for me? And we get confused, and so we've come up with false views of holiness. The Roman Catholic Church has a false view. The Eastern Orthodox Church have false views of holiness. Their views are that priests, bishops, popes, nuns, monks, they're holy. They have been set apart as holy. That's, who the, that's what holiness means. The church is a holy place, okay? The rest of us, we just muck along. We just muck along, try to do the best we can. We do our jobs, and, and, and we get married, and we have sex, and we have babies, and, and we're just, we're just the, the wretched down here. But, but the priests and the monks and, and the nuns and the popes, they're holy. That's a false view of holiness. Then there's another false view of holiness. We're going we're to address that view, by the way. There's another false view of holiness. It's called checklist holiness. This, in, in Jesus' day, these guys were known as the Pharisees. In our day, it would be known as what we, they used to be known as the fundamentalists. I don't know if they're still around. And then um, <clears throat> you could even add the Amish to this, a false view of holiness. The Amish, for them, there's certain things that they do and can't do. There's a checklist. And if they do the checklist, uh, they, they got the buggy and, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they wear the clothes and everything like that, then that's true holiness. For the Pharisees, they had it. I'm most familiar with the fundamentalists because that was what was going on in my lifetime. <clears throat> and, they had all, and they had a checklist. They had a checklist. And if you have that checklist and you do the do's and you don't do the don'ts, then you're holy. That's it. And, and all kinds of sayings came out of that. Don't drink, smoke, or chew or go with the girls that do. Which, which is a probably a pretty good idea. But anyway, <laughs> don't drink, smoke, or chew or go with the girls that do. Lips that touch liquor shall never touch mine. A dancing foot cannot be attached to a praying knee. I went to a fundamentalist Bible college, and they had rules. And they had a checklist. <clears throat> Men. Men were not allowed to wear jeans. Men were not allowed to have hair that touched their ear or their collar. Men could not have beards, but they could have a mustache, but it couldn't go past the sides of your mouth. You were not allowed to smoke. You were not allowed to drink. You were not allowed to go to the movie theater, and you were not allowed to dance. You were not allowed to listen to rock and roll music. That was the checklist. And, of course, uh, they have this checklist, and if you did that, then you were holy. The Pharisees had their checklist, and Jesus was, was he constantly went after that. Jesus said that they were hypocrites. Jesus said that they were straining out gnats and they were swallowing camels. Uh, the gnat would be a, a, a fruit fly or something would land in their wine and they would be very careful to strain that out and get that out of there and then they'd swallow down a camel. Because Jesus said, you have this checklist of things that you do, but then there's things that are not even on your list, like pride, like being judgmental, like being covetous. And so Jesus went after them. Jesus opposed checklist holiness. So again, that brings us back to the question, well, what is holiness? Well, when you go back to the Bible and you look at some of the things that Jesus said, he starts teaching us and helping us and helping us to do this. And so, for instance, Jesus said this, the first and greatest commandment is to love God with everything you got, all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, all of your mind, love God, live for God, be devoted to God, worship God, think about God, serve God, be God-oriented. When he was asked to pay taxes, he took the coin. He says, whose picture is on that? Pilate, or, or Caesar, I'm sorry. He says, give to Caesar what's Caesar, but give to God what is God's. That's holiness. Holiness is to love God with everything you got. Secondly, Jesus said, love your neighbors yourself. Be generous, be kind, be helpful, care about your neighbor, do what you do, help your neighbor in some way. And so by loving God and loving your neighbor, you're going to, you're going to live a life that's right. Now, other things were added into this. And, and, and oftentimes we look at what the apostles taught. What did the apostles teach their people when they were teaching holiness? Well, uh, look, at, look at your Bibles. Look at Ephesians where we're at. Ephesians, now, now uh, I, I turned to Ephesians 4, but look at Ephesians 5.18. Do not get drunk with wine. Holy people don't get drunk. 
They don't get drunk on a Friday night. Holy people don't sleep with a person who's not, they're not married to. And that, that, that's very clear. In fact, look at chapter 5 and verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness, let it not even be named among you, which is fitting for the saints, as is fitting for saints. We're the saints. Saints means holy ones. Saints means separated ones for God. Saints are the new humanity who have been saved by God and separated for his glory. And we're not supposed to be fornicating or committing adultery. That's not right. That's not what we're supposed to be about. That's not holiness. Also, we're not supposed to think that life is all about accumulating wealth. Life is not about all of that. Notice again what it says, verse 3. But fornication, all uncleanness, nor covetousness. Let it not even be named among you. That's not what holiness is. And so holiness is the outworking of being the new humanity. Know who you are and then be who you are. Live it out. Live out this new humanity. Be salt and light. See, see the, the biblical vision was this new humanity, these people, these saved people, this church of the living God, these people were to be literally an alternative civilization on earth. We were to be a civilization. Jesus said, you're the salt. You're the light. I'm putting you out there. You're to live differently to them. You're to be countercultural. You're to actually be supracultural. You're, you're, to be, you're to go above this culture. And you're to live out a different culture. You're to be, people are to be able to say, look, there's a new humanity. God is doing a work. There's the kingdom of God. There's the people of God. Look at how they live. Look at how they think. Look at how they function. Look at how they treat one another. Look at how they treat us. Look at who they are. This is different. God is doing something. To God be the glory. That's what holiness was supposed to do. A separate, special people of God. These people. And so that's what Paul is doing here in Ephesians chapter 4. He is saying, listen. Listen, notice, notice how he says it in, verse, uh, in Ephesians 4. Notice how, how he, he addresses this. Look at verse 17. This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. That's the old man. In the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, being ig of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who are past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. You have not so learned Christ. Get rid of it. It's the old man. Don't do that anymore. Don't do what the Gentiles do. Don't, don't get drunk. Don't sleep around. Don't be covetous. Don't do those things. That's what he's saying in this context. He's saying, you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by, the, as the, uh, by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off, or it could actually, I think, better be translated, you have put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, the old humanity, the old humanity. You put off that old Adam humanity, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you have put on or put on the new humanity, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And then he starts listing some things. Verse 25, put off lying. Speak the truth. Old man, put off the old man stuff. That's lying. Be, be a new man. Be, be the new man. Uh, the truth. Verse 26, anger, put it off, put it off. Don't let the sun go down in your anger. And then he comes to verse 28 as he's outlining and defining holiness. And this is the one we're going to look at today. What does it mean to be holy? Here's another example. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. So here's Paul's teaching here. Stop stealing. The guy who's a thief, tell him, stop stealing. Remember you were, when you were over here in the old man and you were a thief and you stole? Stop doing that. Stop stealing. Stop it. Repent. Quit. Stop. Quit being a thief. Quit being a pilfer. Quit ripping people off. Stop. That's the old humanity. You are now the new humanity. So what should you do as the new humanity? And notice what he says. He says, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor. Labor. By the way, this word labor is the Greek word kapiao, kapiao. And I actually use this word a lot. I know this word well, and I use this word a lot when I'm training pastors. I'm going to the DR in two weeks to train pastors, and I'll, met, and I'll press kapiao on, kapiao, kapiao on them. 
Here's what kapiao is. It's the word, and it's the word that's used for pastors and elders to labor. But here's what the word means. To labor and toil until worn out, depleted, exhausted. Paul is saying, stop stealing and get to work. Work hard. Have a work ethic. Work hard. That's what the new man is. That's what the new humanity is. And then notice what he says next. Working with your hands, working with his hands. Tell him, don't steal any longer. Work hard, kapiao, working with his own hands. Working with his own hands. And Paul uses this phrase a lot for himself. Now, Paul's not saying that we all should have manual laboring jobs. That's not what he's saying. What, but, but he uses this as an example. Get to work. Get your hands dirty. Get some calluses. Get to work. Stop stealing. Paul uses this about himself often. In 1 Corinthians 4.12, Paul says this, And we labor, kapiao, working with our own hands. And then he goes on, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. He's talking about him as an apostle, him and Barnabas. And so Paul says here in Ephesians, he says, Work hard, don't steal, let him labor, working with his hands. What is good, what is good. This is part of holiness. Remember, holiness is God being perfectly pure and good. Work what is good. Do a vocation that does good. Maybe it feeds people or clothes people or builds something for people or fixes things for people or cares for people. Some real service that people can do. Now, that, that doesn't mean everybody has to be social workers and, and they have to be, you know, the person who makes and, and planes and finishes wood, the electrician and the, and the engineer and that who makes microphones, the people who manufacture bottles and, and pure water that we can have water bottles, they, doing something to help and benefit and bless society. That's what we should do. Not be loan sharks, not be drug dealers, not lead people into sin, but have a job that does good. Jesus was a builder. Peter, James, John, and Andrew were fishermen. Paul made tents. Cornelius was a military officer. Lydia sold purple. These people had jobs that they did good and they worked hard at them. And then notice the next thing he says. Look at the verse. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Isn't that interesting? Work hard enough Kapiao, work until you're exhausted. Toil, work hard. Don't do the easy route. The easy route was to steal. Let them do all the work. And then when they're heading home from work with their money, put a knife to their throat and say, listen, give me all your money. Then you take the money, and then they head off poor, and you head off rich. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. Get out there, get to work, you do the hard work, you get the calluses, you get dirty, you get sweaty, and then you get, but you do it so that you can provide for your own needs, and you do it so that you would have something to give to those who have need. What a transformation. Work hard enough, take care of yourself, and then have an abundance. That's a profit. There's nothing wrong with making a profit. Make a profit, make a profit, and that profit, then you can help other people as well. And this is taught all through the scriptures. Look in Acts chapter 20 that Dan read for us. Look in Acts chapter 20 and look at verse 32. Paul is to speaking to, actually he's speaking here in the book of Acts, to the Ephesian elders. The elder board at Ephesus. And notice as he's concluding his talk what he says. It's all in this, these, three, these, these uh, four verses. Verse 32. So now, brethren... I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all who are being sanctified. Now, right there, he's just summarized the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, okay? Uh, the word of God is here to build you up and give you an inheritance. But then notice this for Paul, the inheritance, the blessings, the grace, the cross, the blood, the Holy Spirit are for those who are sanctified. Holiness is very much a part of that mix. Verse 33, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Remember, Paul warned against covetousness. That's part of holiness. Yes, you yourselves know, and here I believe the apostle Paul raised his hands and showed them his calluses and showed them his rough hands. And he said this, 
And you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. So notice Paul's doing, he's practicing what he preaches. He not only provided for his own needs, he provided for those who were traveling with him as well. Verse 35, I have shown you in every way by laboring, kapiao, like this, that you must support the weak. Look at that. By working hard and getting callous hands like me, <coughs> you can help needy people who can't do the work. The poor, the sick, the infirm, the elderly, the widows, the orphans, you can help them. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This was a revolutionary, new humanity, new way, kingdom of God way of looking at work and labor and generosity and giving. And it all comes from the reflection of who God is. God is the God who gives. God is the God who gives us rain and sunshine and fertile crops and gives us children and, and fruitful seasons and life and health. And in him we live and move and have our being. Everything good comes from God. And then if that wasn't good enough and we didn't, we didn't give back to him, we didn't worship him, we didn't give thanks to him, we didn't do all that, God then gave his son. He gave his son to die. He gave us eternal life. He gave us grace. He poured all of this out upon us. And this is to have such a powerful impact upon us, new humanity, that we get up off our sorry behinds, get off the couch, put away the chips, put away the remote, put away the video games, and get out there and get a job and make money and work hard to the glory of God in order that we might have something that we can give to the genuinely needy, the genuinely hurting, those who are suffering. That's amazing vision, isn't it? Turn with me to the other passage that Dan read. Well, before you actually turn to that one, <clears throat> I'd like us to turn to 1 Thessalonians. Look at 1 Thessalonians. If you mark the second one Dan read, which is 2 Thessalonians, just look at the 1 Thessalonians first. Chapter 4, verse 9. I want to show you how much this is in Scripture. But concerning brotherly love, <clears throat> you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. By the way, this is the New Testament ethic. <clears throat> Love is the center focus. It is the nuclear reactor of New Testament ethics. Not the Old Testament, not the Ten Commandments, not God thundering from Sinai. It's love. That's, not, that's important. That's all important. I'm not saying that's not important. But this is the center of gravity for, the, for New Testament, New Covenant uh, ethics, holiness, and life. Love. And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. They were actually giving help to their Macedonian brethren. That you also aspire, now notice this, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk worthy, we may walk properly toward those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. This is how Paul understands holiness and love and our service to God. Aspire to lead a quiet life. By the way, I'm just going to throw this out there, but what does that mean in the day and age of Facebook? How about this next one? Mind your own business. What does that mean in the day and age of Facebook, Instagram? You think about it and work that out, and may the Holy Spirit lead us all and help us. And to work with your own hands, as we have commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are on the outside, that they see that you are upstanding, hardworking citizens, and that you may lack nothing. Now turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 that Dan read. And notice what it says. 
Notice how once again, it's all tied together for the apostle. Notice once again, this is the apostolic teaching. Notice once again, this is what holiness is. Notice once again, this is the outworking of grace and salvation. Verse six, but we command you brethren in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, not according to the tradition which he has received from us. And by the way, the focus of that disorderly walking was people who were not willing to work hard. People who were not, they were showing up at their door and saying they wanted, uh, 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 they needed help and they needed, and, and Paul says, no, if they don't work, they don't eat. Watch, you'll see. Verse seven, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow us for we were not disorderly among you. What does that mean? Well, look at verse eight. Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with kapiao and toil night and day. Wait, let's just reread that because we're, 20, we're, we're, we're Americans from 2024. But worked with labor and toil night and day that we may not be a burden to any of you. Now, this is an apostle speaking. Not because we did not have authority. He could have asked them to support him, and he did encourage supporting those who are in ministry but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we heard that there is some among you in, among you in a disorderly manner. Now notice this, what the disorderly was. Not working at all, but are busybodies. Now, those who are such, we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. There's holiness. Work hard, provide for your own needs, and eat your own bread. And then, of course, give to others. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Remember, we were supposed to work hard with our hands and do good. If anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him until he gets a job, until he starts working, until he gets off his lazy butt, until he goes and does. And, but that he may be ashamed. Brother, we can't have fellowship with you. And we can't give you any food because you are capable of going to work. You need to go work. I know you're hungry. But that hunger pain is supposed to be a means of grace to get you up off of your lazy couch and get a job. That's what it was supposed to mean. That's biblical. That's what the Bible teaches, okay? And then he says, but verse 15, Paul very pastorally, very lovingly says, yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now let's, let's apply this to ourselves. Let's apply this to ourselves. First of all, what I want us to see here is what an amazing transformation and turnaround the kingdom of God is supposed to be. The transfer from the old man to the new man is supposed to be. So here this envisions a man over here who was a thief, for goodness sakes. He was a thief. He made a living being a thief. And now he's been transformed by the grace of God and he is over here in the new humanity. And now holiness for him means get a job, work with your own hands, work hard, Provide for yourself and then make a profit and out of that profit, use that profit to help generously help other people. What a transformation. What a wonderful thing. But I want you to also notice this. Work was a pathway of holiness for him. See, unlike the medieval church, unlike the Catholic church in the middle of medieval ages, where it says, oh, just the priests are holy. Oh, just the nuns are holy. Oh, just the monks are holy. And those goofy monks would go around begging. They would beg, and that was supposed to be holiness. And as soon as the Protestant Reformation came along and the reformers started rereading the Bible, they were like, this is ridiculous. See, because what in the medieval church, oh, there's a priest. Oh, there's one. And I'm here up to my knees in cow manure and goat manure and pig manure and chicken manure. And I've got dust all over me from plowing my fields. Or the women were saying, I'm up to my elbows in dirty diapers. And I'm up to my elbows in dirty dishes. And I'm up to my elbows in, 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 in laundry that needs to be done. And, and, and some are saying, I'm, I'm covered with sawdust because I'm a carpenter. And others were saying that, that I'm covered with sweat because I'm a laborer out in the sun. Oh, but here comes the holy man. Here comes the priest. Here comes the monk. Here comes the... And the reformers understood the Bible enough to say, that is not biblical at all. 
You can be up to your knees in manure serving the Lord, and that's holiness. You can be up to your elbows in dirty diapers and dirty dishes and dirty laundry, and that's holiness. You can be covered with sawdust, and that's holiness. That's holiness. That's a way to serve the Lord. That's a way to give glory to God. We're going to get to this in Ephesians, but in Colossians, notice how Paul speaks to slaves. Dear friends, it doesn't get no more menial than being a slave. Slaves. He says this, bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service, but as, as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, slave, whether it's mucking out a, a box stall, whether it's doing laundry, whether it's, it's, it's hauling in crops, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, you serve the Lord Christ. What did Paul just do there? He just made work sacred. He just made work holiness. He just made work to be unto the Lord and to serving the Lord. And so when you're out there mucking that stall, it's not for that master that you're doing it primarily. It's to that master, the Lord Jesus Christ, who loved you and gave himself for you. And you're mucking out that stall. And so do it with all of your heart to his glory and to his honor. You're serving him just as much as that priest is serving him, just as much as that monk is serving him. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are going to be rewarded in that. That's what it means to be holy. It's to do it heartily, to do your labor to the glory of God and to understand it and to be the best that you can and to hone your trade and to work hard and to give it your all. That's what it means to be holy. Now think about this, dear friends, because so many times we go back to these false views of holiness. Some people think that the only way you can be holy is to sit around all day studying the Bible, to pray all day, to run from one Bible study to the other. That's not what it means to be holy in the New Testament. Now, there's a part of that that's a part of aspect of holiness, but that's not what it means. What holiness means in terms of these, this area that we're looking at, labor, is showing up on time. That's holiness. Giving a good eight hours of work for eight hours of pay, that's holiness. Doing it unto the Lord and to his glory, that's holiness. Blessing your employer because you're actually serving somebody greater than your employer, that's holiness. Blessing those who serve because you're doing a real service to them. That's holiness. And then achieving and succeeding and getting raises so that you have more that you can help and help other people with. That's what holiness is. That's what it means to be holy. You see, there's some people that have such a false view. They, they, they get infiltrated by this false view of holiness. And they go to work and they feel like they didn't do anything for the Lord that day. Why? Because they either didn't lead a Bible study in work or they didn't witness to somebody. They didn't give out a track. Oh, I didn't serve the Lord today. <laughs> yes, you did. You did your job to the glory of God. You worked hard. You showed uh, you were salt and light. You were an example to others. In Matthew 5, 16, Jesus says this, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. One of the, the greatest influences I've ever had in my life is a man named Sinclair Ferguson. I have, you can go right in that library and there's many of his books and all of his books have been torn apart and read and, and, and underlined. I was just listening to him this morning on Union with Christ while I was getting ready to come here today. He is, a, he is, a, he is an amazingly godly, very gifted, wonderful blessing of Christ to the, to the church today. He was pastor, he was a, a, a theologian, he was a, a seminary president. He's bore immense amount of fruit. In fact, many of you are going to go see him over at, uh, I think he's going to, is he going to be there? Yeah, you're going to go see him over at Alistair Bakes Conference. I love his testimony. The great Sinclair Ferguson. Do you know how he became a Christian? He heard a businessman give his testimony. That's how the great Sinclair Ferguson became a Christian. As a teenager, he heard a businessman give his testimony. And you know what the businessman's testimony was? The businessman was a non-Christian, and he was getting a, 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 a job in a corporation, and they were walking him through the corporation, and they took him to the typing room where, and this was back, you know, in the, in the 40s, 30s, where, where the, 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 the typists were doing their typing for the corporation. And as he was going through, and they're talking and showing him around and everything, this one woman is just furiously typing over there. 
zing. And he, he just couldn't help but notice her. And he said, what's the story with that woman? That's amazing. What's the story? And the answer was, oh, she's a Christian. That was the answer. She's a Christian. And the non-Christian businessman walked away from that and says, wait a minute. Well, that doesn't even compute with me. What, does that, what even does that answer mean? What does it mean to be a Christian? What do, and from that, he, that woman's witness, he became a Christian. And him becoming a Christian, he told his testimony. And he told his testimony, the great Sinclair Ferguson becomes a Christian. Dear ones, that's a wonderful story. Of the witness of somebody typing to the glory of God. The witness of somebody serving her Lord Jesus Christ by typing with all of her heart to the glory of God. The witness of somebody who was giving all that she could for the glory of God. Dear ones, that's a powerful witness. If we're lazy, if we're doing the great American thing today, which is looking for handouts, waiting for the government to help us, if we have all kinds of excuses on why we can't work hard, oh, my dad was mean, oh, my mom was this, oh, this was bad, oh, I got, you know, this was bad, oh, they teased me at school. We're, we're great for excuses. If you have a sense that the world owes you, if you have a sense that the government is here established by God to get you and give you everything that you need, if you have the idea that, that your parents are supposed to take care of you for the rest of your adult life, if you have the idea that you're going to walk out of college with a bachelor degree, which many of them feel today, and you're you're going to get $200,000 for your first paycheck, and you're going to have a new house and a new car without any labor. If that's the mentality that you have today, or if you have the mentality that you're going to cheat your way into, a, 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 in, in, into having your needs taken care of by lying and getting on disability or by something like that, if you do that, you need to repent. Those are sins. That's wrong. Christians are to labor with your hands. Labor with your hand. Labor. Get a job. Work hard to the glory of God and bring glory and honor to him. That's holiness. And let me add this. Parents, I call upon you. I urge you. Teach your children a work ethic. And somebody may accuse me of having my priorities wrong. And, and, I'll, say, and I'll say to them, I'm teachable. I'm humble. I really am. I know I act like a big shot up here, but I, I'm teaching I'm humble. Somebody may say I have my priorities wrong, but I'll tell you my priorities. Number one, I wanted my children to know God, to know the Lord Jesus Christ, to know the gospel, to be saved. That was my number one goal with my children. But probably number two in raising my children was I wanted them to have a work ethic. I felt like if I could give my children a work ethic, that's better than giving them a million dollars. That's better than giving them a, give them a work ethic. And I want to urge you parents, work, make it your goal to give those children a work ethic. Give them chores. Give them responsibility. Make them work hard. And you know what that'll do to children when children start working hard? Hard work doesn't seem strange to them. I grew up on a farm. My cousins were all from the city. And when my cousins came out to visit me, they couldn't believe it. They, they treated us and looked at us like we were in a, 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 we were in a prisoner of war camp. They, they couldn't believe my parents were so mean. They couldn't believe that we had to do chores. They couldn't believe we had to get up and go to the barn and do chores. They couldn't believe that. They thought this was horrible because for them, work was something like, yikes, work, ooh, that's, uh, yikes, what's scary? For us, work was just what you do. What are you talking about? This is what we do. This is who we are. And there's a confidence and there's a self-confidence and there's a self-assurance and there's a courage and there's an ability to face life when children are learned. And, and I want to urge you parents, early on, give them chores make them responsible, teach them to work, and bless them. Because you know what? Here's the amazing thing, and I believe it's going to happen. I believe that a day is coming when employers are going to say, I need to hire Christians. We only hire Christians. Think about all these little kids here. Think of what would happen if these kids are raised properly with a work ethic and all of the other aspects of holiness. And when they go to work, they go with all their own heart. They go with all their heart. And they go to succeed. They go to be the best that they can be. And they've learned that. And they're honest and they're faithful and they show up. And they work hard and they can be trusted. 
What a powerful witness that would be. If you're going to hire somebody, man, I'll tell you, hire a Christian. Hire those kids that have been brought up in Christian homes. Hire a Christian. Dear ones, that's a witness to the glory of God. And that's what it means to be holy. May God help us to live all of these things out for his glory. If you change a diaper, change it to the glory of God. If you take out the garbage, take it out to the glory of God. If you change a tire, change it to the glory of God. You do these things to the glory of God. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, help us to be a holy people, a different people, a set-apart people, in many ways even an unusual people, who give our lives to you. Father, tomorrow as we either put on the apron, put on the work clothes, put on the tool belt, sit at the cubicle, have a meeting, get on the phone, meet with people, whatever we do, Father. Help us to do it to your glory. Help us to do it as a way of serving the Lord Christ. Help us to do it in such a way. And bless our work, we pray. Bless our work. That we might have an abundance so that we can bless others like you blessed us in giving your son. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Let's stand together and sing as we close, committing ourselves to God and to his glory.